This is the current federal tax developments for the week of March the 26th, 2018. Current federal tax developments are brought to you this week, as always, by Kaplan Professional Education and your State Society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zollers, and we'll be talking this week about a number of developments that took place during the week. We'll talk about the uh, bill Congress passed to fix the grain glitch and also, by the way, put in some new provisions for the partnership audit rules. The IRS talks about increasing attacks against tax professionals to obtain their data. The IRS issues a basically PMTA that tells us issues about whether the 8453 business tax forms must be signed manually. This is one of those issues we get into. And the Supreme Court is going to rule on a tax collection statute that we have to worry about here. So we're going to take a look at a number of different things going on. And so we'll start with the new bill that we got. Yes, another new law, just what we need. This is one we're expecting. It's Consolidated Appropriations Act, comma, 2018. Apparently, we've now decided to not say the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2018, but we decided to put a comma in place instead of saying of. So it is Consolidated Appropriations Act, comma, 2018. It was signed into law on March the 23rd, 2018. Now, this bill contains, in addition to basically the whole spending for the entire government, so we have all the appropriations in place for everything, it contains a number of tax provisions. They were mainly in the areas of what we're going to call technical corrections. But one of the big ones was a fix for what's known as the grain glitch. The grain glitch, for those who are not aware, was going to give a really huge break to farmers who sold their grain to a cooperative, farmer-owned cooperative. It was going to effectively put uh, those entities that purchased grain that were not farmer-owned cooperatives out of business. Because, you know, why in the world would you sell where it's going to pay tax on the full amount you sell to this entity when I only have to pay tax on 80% when I sell to this one? So kind of a problem in how the law was written. This is part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. What the grain glitch does is effectively removes the uh, 199 cap, a 20% special subtraction rules that were in place for cooperatives. So all the cooperative stuff you may have read about that dealt with the new qualified business income deduction, that's all out of there. So the deduction for the patronage dividends and other such issues, those all disappeared and went away under this provision. So effectively, we now have that. Now we turn around and we put back in the bill what's essentially the Section 199 uh, rules, our old 199 rules are back in the bill. So the old 199 rules, effectively the 9% subtraction for qualified domestic production. It's gone for everybody except cooperatives. Cooperatives can't get the qualified business income deduction, but they get the special old 9% one back in, limited by W-2 wages and all the other rules we had before. Same basic, same basic structure. There are some minor changes, but it's the same basic structure. If you work with cooperatives, you want to read this. If you don't work with cooperatives, you probably aren't going to worry too much about this but it was very big from that standpoint. The other major thing that got added into the Consolidated Appropriations Act is that Congress did finally pass, or let's say put into the law, what's going to be the long-awaited technical corrections for the comprehensive partnership audit rules. Now, it's kind of a good news, bad news line here. The good news part of this is that we're going to get the technical corrections that we thought we were going to get all along. That's kind of helpful because, you know, there are a lot of those things. There were things in those rules passed back in 2015 that needed to be fixed. Now, we had these technical corrections. You may remember in December of 2016, there was an attempt to try to get them passed. They didn't go through. And they've been kind of sitting there ever since. All 2017, Congress was otherwise occupied, so they never went through at that point. The IRS has issued proposed regulations. Those proposed regulations assumed most of this, but not all of this, was going to be part of the law. So some of the commentary you may have heard before about the proposed regs being overreaching, that they were doing things that they really shouldn't be doing, that may not stand up as well anymore. We're just going to have to kind of watch this and see what happens. Uh, in essence, the, the, this now authorizes some of the stuff in the proposed regs that was a little concerning about, well, the law doesn't specifically authorize those things. 
However, the negative about this is the IRS will probably have to make revisions to the proposed regs because, of course, the regs don't say anymore what they used to say. So we have a problem there. And that probably means we're going to get them out even later than we thought we're going to get them out. So kind of a good news, bad news situation. Just be aware, though, we have that. If you want to actually go take a look at this bill, we have links on the website and we have links in the document you can download for this week's articles. Uh, if you want to read the bill, if you get the entire bill, the tax provisions don't start till page 2033. And it's a 2,232-page document. So if you start reading on page one, it'll be quite a while for you at the tax provisions. 2033 has the tax provisions. Uh, the uh, technical corrections, other than the tax technical correction rules, other than the TCJA technical correction rules, begin at page 2057. And the partnership audit rule changes begin at page 2089. So if you want to review the bill that's there, we also have links for you, the Joint Committee on Taxation, has produced the technical ex explanations of the revenue provisions of this bill. You can download that as well. That will explain the tax provisions in this bill. Again, all of that is for your reading. Uh, probably we'll do a deeper dive into this later, but as you may be aware, it's tax season. I need to get some stuff done. You probably do too. So not really doing the deep dive on this changes right now. Again, the big people is going to affect cooperatives. Obviously, that's going to be a big effect. Uh, it also, the partnership audit rules, that's going to affect a lot more people, but we've got to get some time to go through and figure out how those changes are going to impact everything. Now let's go on the next big development here. The IRS noted that we've had a big increase in data breaches involving tax professionals. Okay. In this case, this is news release IR 2018-68 issued on March the 22nd of 2018. In this news release, the IRS warns of a new wave of new client phishing emails. Now, these phishing emails, you probably have all received these, right? Somebody's writing to you, and apparently they're ramping up now. The idea is we're into the end of tax season. You're busy. You may not pay as much attention. You know, and their theory probably is, too, that, hey, this is the end of tax season. If you're going to get new tax compliance clients, you're going to get them right now, right? I mean, in essence, come... April, you know, come April 18th, the, uh, you know, the number of people looking to get taxes done is going to go way down. So the idea is, well, now you're going to your last minute push trying to grab in new clients if you need new clients. And unfortunately, right now, I just have to work through what I've got. I'm not going to worry too much about that. But apparently they've decided to go down that route. The new client email, as we know, sends you an email and says, oh, by the way, I've got this. They may say I've got an IRS notice that I'm attaching. I've got my W-2s. I've got my tax information. And they want you to download that stuff. Obviously, when you download and view that stuff or open it, what it tries to do is run various processes that will install malware on your system. And then from that point, hopefully try to today, what they're trying to do for the main part is take over your network. Now, this is just a variant of standard spear phishing. That is a targeted email campaign to get information from you. So they're playing the odds that you're going to pick it up. Now, the IRS did note that this year professionals have been attacked a lot more. Uh, they said basically they're seeing a 60% increase uh, in January and February, the number of firms that reported breaches as opposed to the prior year. Now, again, this number is only 75 who reported data theft. So, yeah, it's up. But again, considering the total number of tax preparers in the country, not exactly huge, but still disconcerting because I think almost all of us have gotten that particular new client email. The IRS does, I think, also worry, probably appropriately, uh, that there may be some people out there who just aren't aware that they've had uh, issues with their system. And they do give us some warning signs to look at that might indicate that your systems have been infiltrated. Uh, you start getting a whole bunch of rejects because their social security numbers are already used for a whole bunch of your clients, way more than, you know, suddenly it seems like, you know, every return you're filing is coming back rejected. Why is that? Well, it might be they got in your data and they filed returns for your clients. That's something they've been doing. Uh, the number of returns filed with your EFIN exceeds the number of your clients. So if you go online and check that, the IRS suggests you do that. You want to see how many, how many tax returns have been filed under your electronic filer identification number. You know, if you've got 400 clients and there's been 2,000 returns filed under your ID number, that's a problem. You know, we have to worry about that. 
Uh, network computers may start running slower than normal. That would be very true if there's traffic, if they're trying to especially try and take data off the network or the malware is just badly written, so it slows things down. Uh, computer cursors moving or changing numbers without touching the keyboard. Yeah, if you saw that, that's a pretty uh, blatant problem. And network computers that lock out the practitioners. That's also potentially a reason why you might have them have taken over the system. And while you're sitting there trying to figure out what's going wrong, calling your IT guy so he comes in next week, they're actually filing returns on your behalf. Or not so much on your behalf, but you get the idea. You know, they also outline some of the steps you should take to protect your data. This is pretty much a standard list they always do. Train your staff to recognize phishing emails, things that are unusual. Watch for emails, especially ones that claim to come from your software provider, cloud storage provider, other entity. Uh, you know, you should also take a look at creating a data security plan. They suggest look at IRS publication 4557. And from the National Institutes of Standards Technology, the Small Business Information Technology Security, the Fundamental Publications from 2016. They suggest you install anti-malware, antivirus everywhere. Keep it up to date. As I've mentioned before, yeah, you need to do that, but don't count on it really solving much of anything. Okay. It is a necessary step, but it is far, far, far from complete protection. If you don't understand why that's true, you don't really understand anti-malware and antivirus software. Uh, the perpetrators are very good at designing their software and testing it against that stuff right away. So these guys are always playing catch up. So the most recent attacks are always going to get around your anti-malware and antivirus software. It's just a given. Uh, use strong in these passwords. They suggest 10 characters or more. Password protect all wireless devices. Uh, use the phrase or words that are easily remembered. And they still suggest to change passwords frequently, despite the fact that NIST, who they're telling you to go read the document for, has now removed that recommendation. Find that to be kind of funny. The IRS is going to take a while to catch that up. Uh, now, I understand there are people in Kaplan who disagree with that NIST requirement, uh, other parts of Kaplan. Uh, I understand why they do. I understand the technical reasons. I just think rapidly changing passwords tends to get people to compromise data in other ways and in ways that really we don't want it compromised. Uh, I just think that it's going to be a problem. So bottom line, uh, you know, I, I would say don't don't really worry too much about that part of it. But yeah, you may be forced to do it. Encrypt all sensitive files and emails. Use strong password protections. Makes lots of sense. By the way, the one thing for passwords they didn't mention that really is important is use different passwords for all major operations. If you're using the same password to get in your tax software, to get on the IRS e-services site, to get on, let's say, your banking site, to get on Facebook, to get on whatever, you know, high school reunion website you set up an account for, you're just waiting to be have your stuff taken over. Different passwords for every single location, especially all the sensitive ones. And don't use a password. Don't ever use a password on a site like Facebook or, you know, Facebook's Facebook. Yeah, they got some issues. We've talked about that before. You know, LinkedIn had a loss of passwords many years ago. Uh, Adobe's had a loss. Just if you're, those passwords are lost, these people will try them on other sites and you're just set up to be taken over. Don't do it. Understand that background. Uh, they talk about wiping clean and destroy old computer hard drives that contain sensitive data. That's incredibly important. If you're disposing of computers, don't just go kind of hand them out to some charity, you know. And by the way, don't think that merely by, you know, reformatting the hard drive or reinstalling Windows, you've really removed that data. You probably haven't unless the drive was encrypted and unless you basically re-encrypt the drive with a new key. Uh, you know, and, you know, with all the garbage, uh, the odds are that data is still sitting there uh, and could be accessed by a third party who gets that computer. So be very, very careful. There is a reason why a lot of computer recycling operations automatically, if you go look at them like on eBay, where they're selling their computers, they always sell them without hard drives. Why? Because they're not, you know, the hard drives are a leakage of data. Nobody wants the hard drives going out. So a lot of organizations simply will pull those hard drives and dump them before they'll turn them over to any recycling operation. Uh, limit access to taxpayer data to individuals who need to know and check e-services for the number of uh, filed with e for your structure. 
Okay, a couple of more developments this week. And again, we're in tax season and uh, we'll see what else ha- what's all happening. Uh, let's talk about IRS Program Manager Technical Advice, PMTA 2018-008. Now, this talks about how you sign certain forms. And the question had arisen about can the business forms 8453 be signed by various mechanisms that are allowed for the individual form 8453. Now, I need to caution you here is this PMTA is not real clear, but it appears to be mainly concerned about the ERO signature. Okay. But the concepts would seem to apply to taxpayer signatures too. So just be careful here about how it works. The IRS provided, you know, they provided that the electronic return originator, the ERO, could sign a return via various mechanisms. Notice 2007-79, about 10 years ago, said that you could use various methods to sign Form 8878, which is your U.S. individual income tax declaration for declaration for an IRS e-file return, Form 8878, an e-file signature authorization form, for Form 4868 or Form 4350, and Form 8879, the IRS e-file signature authorization form, by various uh, alternative means. That include a rubber stamp, a mechanical device, or a computer software program. Now, that notice from 10 years ago, and you may remember it, at the time, probably, you were fi- if you're like a lot of people, you were just kind of getting into filing entities. You'd been filing maybe individuals for a while. And, you know, entities weren't required, so we had various options. It did tell us that the notice applies only to EROs and does not alter signature requirement for any other type of document that's required to be manually signed, such as elections, applications for change accounting methods, powers of attorney, or consent forms. In addition, this doesn't alter the requirement that those forms be signed by the taxpayer, making those forms by handwritten signature or other authorized means. Okay. In essence, very restrictive rule. Well, the problem, of course, came that the IRS internally was asking, well, we're seeing some EROs that are signing business forms. And that, by the way, includes not just the 8453 series, uh, but also there's letter 3083, return statement of receipt for the 94X online signature pin. How's that for a weird term? If you work with that, that's also one they saw. The IRS points out in this, and basically in this program manager technical advice, that They never have authorized any other signature methods besides a handwritten signature for use by the EROs for any forms other than the specified ones. That is the uh, the, the 8453 series of forms, you know, all those signature forms for e-filing or, you know, a lot of the 941 forms. By the way, the PMTA gives you a whole bunch of the 941 related documents, but not this one. And the ruling becomes very simple. No authority has ever been issued that generally covers signing forms via these other means. And as it stands right now, anything that's not specifically covered by these rulings must be manually signed. Now, before you freak out too much, you're saying, but wait, my my client signed the electronic filing form and then they fax it back to me or they email it back to me. Well, they have to manually sign it. That is a given. But emailing it or faxing it back is specifically allowed by the IRS if you go on to the electronic filing page and go on to the documentation about how to send it back over. So that is an authorized means of filing those forms. But it does suggest that the ERO should physically sign, you know, while your computer software could, quote, sign the 8453 uh, that goes out, you know, for purposes for the individual returns. For the ones that are going out for the business returns, you're supposed to physically sign the form. How this works and how big a deal it is, open question, but still interesting problem. And that came out this week. Also, we had the U.S. Supreme Court got involved in a case this week. How's that going on? It had tax implications. And no, it's not. No, it is not the Wayfair case. We're waiting on that one. This is separate. This is Marinello versus United States from the U.S. Supreme Court, docket number 161114. It was issued on March the 22nd, 2018. What happened in the Marinello case? Mr. Marinello, well, you know, he really didn't keep books. Shall we say he kept no books on his business and he claimed, not very convincingly at trial, he's being charged with basically some criminal tax matters that, you know, he really didn't have to file a return. He's not income less than $1,000. That didn't work. Other things came in. 
He had been warned by attorneys and accountants that he had to keep books and records, that if he didn't do so, he was exposing himself to huge legal liabilities. He didn't do that. Now, the IRS charged him under Section 7212A. And under 7212A, it's a felony for an individual to corruptly or by force endeavor to obstruct, obstruct or impede the due administration of this title, this title being Title 26, United States Code, otherwise known as the Internal Revenue Code. When the case went to the jury, he was instructed about the various ways one could obstruct, but they didn't specifically say that the obstruction had to relate to a specific IRS investigation. You know, in essence, they just said generally if that was true, he could do it. Uh, he objected that, no, 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 no. In essence, for me to be convicted under 7212A of corruptly or by force endeavoring to impede, construct or impede the due administration of this, of this title, meaning the Internal Revenue Code, uh, there had to be a specific IRS investigation that he was aware of that he was trying to impede directly. And, of course, he said he wasn't aware of that. The government didn't prove he was aware of it. The government claimed, wait, 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 this says just administration of this title. Well, you know, one of the things administering this title is filing tax returns. And he was obviously trying to foul up the processing and administration of the returns. He was trying to gum up the works intentionally. And because of that, really, he violates 7212A. Well, the Supreme Court said no. The U.S. Supreme Court overruled the Second Circuit in this case. The court in this case held, the majority, a 7-2 majority in this case, uh, held that, in fact, that was it was required the IRS show a specific investigation or that Mr. Marinello had a reasonable expectation that an investigation was either underway or was going to go on, become underway, and that he was acting to impede that actual or foreseeable investigation that he, that he knew about, you know, that was there. And since they hadn't instructed the jury on that process, obviously, they kick it back to the Second Circuit. It was a 7-2 decision. Uh, we have the two, you know, the two minority justices, uh, in this case, Justice Thomas, in this case, wrote the opinion for the minority. And Justice Thomas argued that, wait, no, you're reading way more into this. You're, you're, co you're creating this investigation requirement out of whole cloth. You're saying it says for per any a part of this title, processing tax returns is administration under this title. Therefore, if he's trying to interfere with that, that's enough. Now, of course, the majority doesn't agree with that. The majority says no. The majority's answer is kind of there are other there are other basically criminal statutes for violating the Internal Revenue Code that would would apply for doing various other things. And so because of that. This one is only for trying to corruptly deal with an investigation. It also talks about the first clause of this, talks about specifically threatening like a revenue agent, saying, see, it's really talking about a current and run going investigation. Obviously, Justice Thomas says it doesn't say that, so you can't go that route. But nevertheless, seven of the justices says, yeah, we don't care if it doesn't directly say that. It implies that, so we're going to require them to show an actual investigation. Well, we're getting later in tax season, and sometime shortly, in about three weeks, you're probably going to be coming up for air, and your state society catalogs will be out there. Your state societies will have posted everything to the website. Some states already have the things there, though I realize you're probably busy. But you might want to take a look there to come up on what you're going to be learning about and studying this year. We're going to be doing a lot of sessions. I'm working on a bunch right now that, are, that either have been booked or are being booked on this issue. We're going to be doing a couple of sessions very early in tax, very early after tax season, uh, coming up toward the end of May, uh, that I'll be doing sessions specifically on the qualified business income deduction. We're doing a couple of those, and we'll announce those when the states actually get those dates out. But I've got two of them coming up right at the end of May. So I've got a couple coming up on that issue. So you might want to keep your eyes out for those. Uh, hopefully coming to a location near you. We'll see. We got two. So, well, two out of 50. You got some chance there. Uh, and we'll also be looking, though, at a whole bunch of other courses during the year. I know that we've been spending a lot of time updating our courses for the tax course for the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. I think everybody else has as well. So lots of stuff to learn this year. Be sure to pay attention to what your state society offers. This has been the Current Federal Tax Developments for the week of March the 26th, 2018. 
As always, we post information during the week as we get time to write it up this time of year that becomes a little bit tougher, but we work on it. Uh, on currentfellowtaxdevelopments.com, you can go there, read the material. You can also subscribe to our email list that will email you when we post something there. Uh, you can send any questions or comments to me. My email address, edzollers at currentfellowtaxdevelopments.com. I do post on Twitter when we have a new thing go up on the website, so you can follow me there at Ed Zollers. Mainly I use it for that. Sometimes I'll use it for other things, but that's the main reason I'll post that uh, Twitter feed. You can also follow me. I do discussions on the subreddit on Reddit of tax pros. So that's at www.reddit.com slash r slash tax pros or some discussions there. And otherwise, I just wish you all the best uh, in this in these coming weeks. We know this is the wild time of the year. We'll hopefully, uh, hopefully you survive all this and hopefully you come out the other side. Uh, we'll keep an eye on what's happening in the tax law. Hopefully keep you a little bit up to date here the last couple of weeks and see you hopefully next week. We'll talk about more current federal tax developments.